Good morning. A couple things I want to address before we get into the message. First, um, I always want to be someone that gives thanks. And so as, as we go through the daily business of, of church and ministry and worship and fellowship, I, I try to keep my eyes open for people that are doing things worthy of thanksgiving. And I wanted to say thanks this morning to Deb, who consistently week in and week out comes up and plays the piano before service. Most of you probably never hear it because of the general hubbub of greetings, holy godly greetings, of course. And then she also um, plays at the end of the service. So thank you, Deb, for making a point to do that for us. Also, one of the things that we've gotten away from that I think we need to get back to um, are the uh, testimonies. If you have not given your testimony to email, testimony at Jesus Community Church, or it's been a while since you've done it, um, come talk to either Christy or I. I would like to give you the opportunity to come up before the church and let the church know how God brought you from where you were to where you are. Okay? All of us have a similarity of, of testimony in that each of us were in a pit and God reached down and took us out of the pit. But the circumstance that he led us through to bring us to that place can vary greatly. So if you would be willing to share your testimony, please come to Christy or I so we can get you in on the schedule. All right? Um, I do have an Ask the Pastor question that was given to me last week. Um, the question is, when did the Jews become Jews? At conception. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, does anybody here know how the, when the Jews became Jews? When did God start calling them? When did people start calling them Jews? Does anybody know the other names by which they had previously been known? Hebrews? Hebrews? Israelites. Judites? <clears throat> Israelites. Israelites. Yeah, the, the three big ones, and, and I'm going to lump Judites in with Jews, uh, were, were the Hebrews, the Israelites, and the Jews. And we see, uh, I'm going to take each of those in turn, we see that Abram is called Abram the Hebrew in Genesis chapter 14. Now the word Hebrew means to cross over or to pass through, okay? And I think um, in Joshua, when Joshua is recounting for Israel all that God had done for them as a people and, and where they started and where he brought them through, um, the, the idea of Hebrew actually carries with it this, this image of, of crossing over a river. And I think that's significant. If you have your Bible... Open up to um, Joshua chapter 24 because I want to show you something in the course of this dialogue. So we're going we're gonna to start <coughs> we'll start in, in verse 2 and Joshua said to all the people thus says the Lord the God of Israel long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates Terah the father of Abraham and of Nahor and they served other gods <clears throat> then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river now mark that kind of Put a mental note there from beyond the river. Let's, I want you to focus on the number of times in this little passage that they refer to the river crossing over from beyond, taking through. Okay? Chapter 24. 
Picking up in verse 3, Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. And I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with uh, what I did in the midst of it, and afterward I brought you out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. And when they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and made the sea come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, I gave them into your hand, and you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, rose and fought against Israel, and he sent and invited Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Indeed, he blessed you, so I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the leaders of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I gave them into your hand, and I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out before you, the two kings of the Amorites, and it was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities that you had not built, and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. Now, this is a just short summary of, of all that God has done. But if you notice, you look at the number of times God brought Abram across the Euphrates. He brought him across the Jordan. His descendants went into Egypt and then returned across the Red Sea. They wandered in the wilderness. And they came up. On the, if you look at the map of Israel, they actually came up to the east of what is modern-day Israel into what would be Jordan today, and then crossed the Jordan. He brought them over the Jordan. They passed through the waters. All of these are the same root word as Hebrew. Okay? Eber. As a matter of fact, we, we see in Genesis, when it's going through the lineage of people, we see that several generations before Abraham... We have a relative who's known as Eber, E-B-E-R. And that's the same root word from which we get Hebrew. So they were called Hebrews because they were the descendants of Abram who had passed over the river. Okay? So then we move to Israelites. Anybody know where we get the term Israelite? Come on, I know a lot of you know it. Don't be shy. <coughs> From Jacob. When Jacob was returning to his family after he had served uh, Laban and, and married Rachel and Leah, he was coming, he was worried about meeting back up with his brother. Because when they left, uh, when they parted, um, Jacob had to leave because Esau was telling people he's going to kill him. Right? And so he goes off and he works for what, what became his father-in-law Laban and, and worked seven years and gets Leah and then gets Rachel and works another seven years for her and then works another number of years to, to gather flocks for himself. Well, he's coming back and he's kind of worried about how Esau's going to receive him. So he sets up all of these bribes and he sends them off a piece at a time to go and encounter his brother that hopefully his brother will be favorably disposed. The night before they're supposed to meet, he actually separates his family out from the rest of the stuff and, and from himself in the hopes that if his brother came and attacked one part, the other part would be saved. And that night, he wrestled with God. And in his wrestling, um, the, the angel of the Lord said, release me. And, and Jacob said, I will not release you until you bless me. Wow. Um, the angel of the Lord spoke and said, you will no longer be named Jacob, Yaakov. Does anybody know what Yaakov means? Huh? 
heel grabber? Yeah. yeah, grass broke the heel. Because when he was born, he came out holding on to the heel of his brother. And then Israel, what, what does Israel mean? Contends with God. Contends with God. His name went from heel grabber to one who contends with God. I think that is a prophetic name. Because all of the descendants of Jacob became known as Israelites. And over and over and over again, we see that God calls them a stiff-necked and stubborn people. They contend with God. Okay? So we have the first two names. We have Hebrew and we have uh, the Hebrews and we have the Israelites. And then of Jacob, Israel's sons, he had 12, one of whom was Judah. Now, when Israel was blessing his sons, he talked about Judah and, and that the, the rod, the kingship, would not pass from Judah. But the, the Jews were identified by their tribes. And when God brought them into Israel, he divided them up into their lands. They were given specific lands that were to be theirs. Judah got the land that right on the border was Jerusalem, the city of God, the place where God says he put his name. Okay? When the kingdom was split during the time of Rehoboam, the ten northern tribes were given to Jeroboam. The two southern tribes, uh, Judah and Benjamin, remained with Judah. And the two kingdoms became known as Israel in the north, or Ephraim, Joseph's son in the north, which was prophesied before that, that they would be known by Ephraim, and then Judah in the south. And now, we like to think it was a nice, clean separation. It wasn't a nice, clean separation. Because many of the people in the north did not want to give up worshiping in Jerusalem. And they ended up leaving their lands in the north and coming to Jerusalem, or to Judah. And then, then we had on to that the Assyrian conquest, when Assyria came in and, and took out the ten northern tribes, the, the north kingdom of Israel. Many of the people fled and came south. But that kingdom was known as the kingdom of Judah, even though there were many people from other tribes there. Well, then, fast forward 586. Uh, no, that's not right. 586? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's when they fell. Yeah. That's when uh, Jerusalem finally fell, and they were taken off into captivity to Babylon. Fast forward a, a few decades, seven-ish, and we see that Babylon falls to the Medo-Persians. We see that a king named Cyrus, who is prophesied, um, comes to power, and somebody presents him the scriptures where his name is listed as the king that would send the Jews back to their homeland. And he goes, wow, cool, all right, go. And so they come back. Now, somewhere in that exile period, the, the name, instead of being Hebrew and Israel, became Jews. Now we see all, in the New Testament, they're called all three, but predominantly from about 600 B.C. on, they are most often referred to as Jews. Judah's name in the Hebrew is um, <coughs> Judah, Juden, and they became known as Judans because... They were from the tribe, the area, the kingdom of Judah. So when did they become known as Jews? When did they become Jews? Well, I mean, if you look at it from the perspective of God, they always were. If you look at it from our timeline, our, our linear timeline, about 600 B.C. is when it, it really made the transition from Hebrew and or Israelite to Jews. So there's a little bit of trivia for you. Um, I will leave this up on the credenza. <coughs> So if you have any questions about that, feel free to come talk to me. Uh, ask the pastor questions or over there somewhere. Um, if you have your Bibles, open with me to Leviticus chapter what? 23. 23, awesome. That's where we're going today.
All right, so we have spent the last couple of weeks talking about the Feast of Trumpets, which is known in, a, in Hebrew as what? Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, yeah, yeah, that's what they call it, but that's not actually the Feast of Trumpets. That actually means the head of the year. And we've talked about, we've laid the foundation. Where did this thing come from? We, we've placed up the walls. How was it celebrated? Why was it celebrated? Today we're going to move into this new house and live there because, see, we've God spent a lot of time through the Hebrew Scriptures building this house. And He didn't build it to, to, to just sit there idle, to sit there empty. He wants us to have understanding so that we can move in to His promises. And today we're going to start looking at how those promises relate to us. Okay, things that we need to be aware of. So first, let's look at a couple things in the New Testament. Um, Matthew 24. Well, actually, let's, let's read the passage in Leviticus so we're all on the same page. I'm on page 129. <laughs> okay, so verse 23. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying... Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, <coughs> on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpet, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. Now, last week we looked at what that food offering was. We looked at some of the specifications as to how they were to celebrate this day. Uh, previously, we talked about uh, some of the issues with timing of things. Um, you've got to keep in mind that the Jews move according to a lunar calendar, okay? Which means that their month is 28 days. Now, the problem is that if you keep on a lunar calendar and only have your 12 months of 28 days, it won't be very long until the, the feast that you were celebrating in the spring, you're now celebrating in the fall, and the feast you're celebrating in the fall, you're now celebrating in the spring, and everything just gets messed up. So the Jews did a couple of things to address this, but the, the big one that you need to know is that periodically they would just slap a new month in the year. Okay? To get everything back. Now, we, we kind of do the same thing because every four years we have, we celebrate, leap, we celebrate, we have, I don't celebrate. I, I don't really even pay much attention to it. Um, but, but we have the leap year day, and we just stick a day in on the end of February. Okay? Well, they would stick an entire month in. This leads to some complications, because if you're not part of the people that decide, oh yeah, this year we're having an extra month, things can get messed up. So, so there's, there's a, this whole understanding that their calendar is not like ours. So when we're looking at Passover... It skips around within the year, within the few months, okay? Because they're, they're putting it according to what God had given them as the first month, Abib. And they're looking at the 10th day and then the 14th day. And because they're on a lunar calendar, that thing moves, all right? So uh, this year we will be doing Seder on Passover Eve, which I think is really cool. Um, We'll talk more about that later. Okay, let's turn real quick to Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to read you a passage here. It's just one verse. Actually, I'm going to read you the section, but there's one verse I want to focus on. Okay, in Matthew 24, does anybody just know offhand what Matthew 24 is all about? Signs of the end. Signs of the end. The, the, the troubled times. Bad news. Bad stuff's coming. And Jesus is telling them this so they'll be prepared. And, and those far off will have this so that we will be prepared. Okay. So, in verse 29, he says this, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, 
And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, 31 is what I want you to pay attention to, but the, you, the setting is in place. Okay? The setting is in place. It says, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Okay? A couple things I want to focus on here real quickly because when Jesus lays this out, there's a certain process that's going to happen. First, he's coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The earth is going to mourn when they see him. Why do you think the earth is going to mourn when they see him? I think because they're going to recognize who he is and they don't go. <coughs> he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. Okay? Now, if we were just to leave that there and, and just read this verse in isolation, which I am going to encourage you, no, I'm going to admonish you, don't do. Don't ever just read a verse outside of its context. And don't ever read a verse outside of the context and the flow of all of Scripture. Okay? You can come up with some really bizarre teachings when you do that. <clears throat> All right, and, and we are really good at it because we like to blink over the parts that are hard to understand or we don't like and focus on the ones we do like. And without understanding the context of the one that we do like, we, we really don't understand what it's telling us. Okay, so um, the loud trumpet call, he will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now this is an echo of another passage in the Hebrew Bible, Isaiah 27. Um, I'm going to flip over to that real quick. Actually, I've got it right here. Isaiah 27, verse 13. Isaiah says, And in that day a great trumpet will be blown, and those who were lost in the land of Assyria, and those who were driven out of the land uh, to the land of Egypt will come, and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. These verses echo one another. I believe they're a statement of the same event. Okay? And the key to these verses is, is that a trumpet blast will signify, and not just any trumpet blast, the great trumpet blast. Now, does anybody remember from our, our, our teaching, Steve came up and he spoke about the, the four blasts that were used for Rosh Hashanah, for the Feast of Trumpets. Does anybody remember the last blast? The, the fourth blast was called the Great Truah. The Great Blast. The Great Blowing. The Great Trumpet. Okay? Now when Nathan played this for us, and I'm actually, uh, you know, I, I'm putting you on the spot, Nathan. You might want to grab that and go practice because I want you to do it for us again at the end. <laughs> Your dad said it was okay. <laughs> um, that last blast, because remember we have the three blasts, and then we have the, the, the staccato, and then the really fast staccato, and then we have the great blast. And we, we do the first three sequences 99 times. It comes up to 99 blasts, and then that last blast is the great true up. And you blow it and you hold it as long as you possibly can. Do, do you see what that said? The great trumpet blast. <coughs> I think that, that, that great trumpet blast, because in the, the blowing, that represents redemption. That's, that is that all that we have hope, that we're hoping for, is met in that, gr that great trumpet blast. <coughs> we go, okay, well that's great, but I mean this looks pretty specific to the Jews. Ah, we're not done yet. Let's uh, look at a couple other passages here real quick. Uh, one thing that you need to keep in mind before we move on. Uh, throughout Scripture, the trumpet was used for a couple of different things. One of the things that it was used was for judgment. It would be to call the people together to let them know that judgment was coming, that judgment would be passed. I believe when that trumpet blows, there will be judgment. 
Now for those that are part of the body of Christ, whether they be Jews, whether they be Gentiles, our judgment is not unto salvation. We're, we're, we're saved. If you have given your life over to Jesus Christ, if you have made your confession of faith and you believe in your heart that He is Lord, that what He has said He has done is done, who He has said He is, He is, you're okay. Alright? You're saved. Now, something that will naturally come out of this, one of those things that has to come out of salvation, Scripture says there are two things that prove your salvation. The first is obedience. You will obey. If, if you really have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. See, a lot of us want Him as Savior, but we're not so, much, we're not so sure about Lord. Because we don't want anybody to tell us what to do. You know? We, we want to do it on our own. We, we, hey, we appreciate that you're not sending us to hell, but I got it. So that's, that's not how it works. Because in accepting Him as Savior, you have to acknowledge Him as Lord. Because He's the one that set the rules that required Him to be our Savior. Okay? So, when you accept Him as Lord, you obey and, and don't, don't, get, don't get caught up in, oh gosh, the Ten Commandments, the, the 600, I, how am I, no. See, we're actually called to a higher law than that. And, the, and what, what's cool about this law is that this law is written on our hearts. And it's His Holy Spirit that lives in us that convicts us when we get off. When we're off and, and things aren't quite right, it's His Holy Spirit that's sitting there going, Pay attention. <laughs> well, well, see, you're lucky. You get, you're get you tender. A lot of times for me, it's more like this. <laughs> okay? But we've got that inside of us. And His Holy Spirit teaches us those things that we need to know that we might live. Now, one thing I want to share with you. I was, while we were doing worship this morning, there was something that really I feel like people here need to be aware of. When you come to Christ, the Word says that there is therefore now no condemnation. Listen to me, folks. The enemy is a liar. And when he speaks to you, the only thing he can tell you is lies. Because when you come to Christ, when you lay it all down before him, his grace washes all of our sin away. And if you stand in condemnation. You are not standing in condemnation by Jesus Christ. You are listening to the lies of the devil who wants to tear you down and bind you up and keep you separated from the love of God. Okay? In Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Remember, the purpose of our enemy is to accuse us and to deceive us. Okay? And so many Christians walk around with this, this idea that I'm not worthy. You're right. You're not worthy. None of us were worthy. That's what makes His grace grace. Because it's completely dependent on Him, not on us. Okay? And if, if you're listening to the lies of the enemy today, I want to encourage you. Scripture says that you are not condemned. As a matter of fact, Scripture says that Jesus is your advocate before the Father. That He is interceding on your behalf. And when the enemy comes and he stands before the Father and, and you're there in the middle and, and he points the finger and says, yeah, you see what he did? You see what she did? You see the record? I've got the record. Bring in the rest because it's going to be more than one scroll. You have an advocate that stands on the other side and says, no, I, I've paid the price. I have paid the price for their punishment. They stand now not in their own righteousness, but they stand in my righteousness. So when the enemy comes against you and he lies to you and he condemns you and he says you're not good enough, he says that, that, that you, you, you're, you're never going to be uh, acceptable in God's sight, he's lying. And you need to take firm grasp of the truth of the word that says that God loves you, that he has covered you with grace, that he has cast your sins as far away as the east is from the west. The only person that can give that any credibility and any power is you. When the enemy comes against you and starts lying to you, if you listen to those lies and start believing those lies, you are standing in direct violation and direct opposition to what God has said is true. Okay? So I just want to encourage you today, 
Walk in truth. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. Don't give him any room in your life to celebrate anything. Okay? So back to the, the trumpet. That one was for free. <laughs> All right, so what does this mean to us? I'm glad you asked. Turn, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. There are two passages that we're going to hit today and wrap this thing up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 13. Verse 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But do not, excuse me, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Okay? This is one of those passages that we hold on to when we lose a loved one. We don't grieve as the world grieves because they don't have hope. We have a hope. And, and we believe as part of that hope that we will be reunited, okay, with our, our brothers and sisters in Christ that have gone before us. Okay? So verse 14, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so... Through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now here's, here's where it gets good. This is where as Christians we've got to be paying attention here. Okay, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Look at verse 18. That's huge. This right here, this passage right here, should be an encouragement to us. This is something that we should look at and go, ah, yes. Okay? A couple of things I want to point out to you, starting in verse 16. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command. With the voice of an archangel. And with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Now this, this passage we believe to be speaking of the rapture, the, the snatching away. When Christ comes and removes his bride out from this world. Because God's wrath is coming. And, and the world is going to be in a bad, bad place. Alright? Uh, this, is, this is, whether you believe this is before the tribulation actually starts. Or before the outpouring of God's wrath. I want you to know that whether you believe in pre-trib or pre-wrath, it's going to stink here on this planet. Things are going to spin downward and downward and downward. They're going to continue spinning downward until that place where the Antichrist can step in and bring a peace. Okay? And things have got to get chaotic. And if you think that the world doesn't like Christians now, it's just going to get worse. Okay? It's going to get worse. It has to get worse. Okay? So keep this passage, kind of mark it with your finger because we've got another passage we're going to go to and then we're going to tie these things together. Flip back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. We're 
going to read just the last section of it, starting in verse 50. <clears throat> I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Now, right here, I don't believe that Paul is, is telling us something that is mysterious. I think what he's saying is he's revealing something that previously was a mystery. Okay, I think he's giving us a revelation, not a puzzle. All right? We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Put your finger on that, that little phrase there, last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your, your labor is not in vain. Now, I want to back up here because you see that this parallels Paul's writings in Thessalonians. Okay? Now, I, I know I'm going to step on a couple toes here. Okay? Because in Revelation, there's also mention of the last trumpet. Actually, there's, there's quite a few trumpets, but the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, Okay, we see in Revelation like 6, 7, and 8 goes through all the different trumpets. Okay, I don't believe that this last trumpet is that last trumpet. And, and I'll, I'll tell you why. For two reasons. <coughs> First, pragmatically. Because when Paul wrote this, it was some 45 years prior to John's revelation. And, and Paul had no word of the seven trumpets and the last trumpet. But, but that, that we can excuse because God reveals all things. Okay, So even that one, you could go, well, yeah, but, you know, I mean, Paul makes it pretty clear that he received a revelation from God that was beyond anything that we did. All right? But if we go back to the Feast of Trumpets and we look at the last trumpet call, the last one is different than all the ones preceding, correct? It's the one that brings redemption and hope. And what he's saying here, uh, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. We shall receive the fulfillment of the promise of the atonement, not just in, in the spiritual world, not in our spirits, but this old mortal body, that suffers from the effects of a, a sinful world shall be taken away and replaced with an immortal body, an imperishable body. That is the redemption that God has promised. He has already covered our sins. Our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west, but we still operate and function in a world that has sin. We still stumble. We have not yet been made perfect in how we live. This redemption, this is the fulfillment of that promise that what is sinful now, that, that is corrupt, that, that mortal part of us that, that has to deal with our patterns of behavior, that's going to be taken away. It's going to be cast down. It's going to be removed. And then God is going to give us that body that is going to be wrapped in white raiment. Okay, and then, then there's the whole giving of the name and, and awesome things happen. Okay, so the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. We will become imperishable, we will become immortal, and then the saying comes to pass. Now this is why we're going to get into this next week with Yom Kippur and, and the Feast of Atonement. This 
passage is part of why I don't believe that the Feast of Atonement has been completely fulfilled. Okay? Because I think the Feast of Atonement is the flip side of the coin that started with Passover. Okay? At Passover, the lamb was slain, and we come in and Jesus Christ is our lamb. He is our Paschal lamb, and he went to the cross in our place, and that sacrifice was sufficient for all of our sin. Okay? But the fulfillment of the atonement has yet to come. Because if it had already come, then this world would not be corrupt. Okay? There is the fulfillment of that atonement when God sets everything right. And I, I can't wait. I can't wait. I, I get so tired. You know, there's a, a condition that I think pastors have that's called soul weariness. Every pastor that I've talked to eventually gets this at some point. And it's not, it's not a physical thing. It can manifest physically. But it's one of those things where you deal with the ugliness of life all the time. And I think as Christians, if you're really walking the walk, you will probably deal with this too. You just get tired of the garbage. You just get worn out. Because it doesn't matter how much you preach. It doesn't matter how much you teach. It doesn't matter how much you love. It doesn't matter how faithful you are. People are stupid. <laughs> and I'm people. I'm stupid. Okay? Because you can put the way right in front of them and say, hey, look, go this way and you'll avoid all kinds of heartache. You'll, you'll avoid all kinds of stumbling. You'll avoid all kinds of traps. Go this way. This way, huh? Yeah, this way, right here. This one right here. Avoid the traps? Great. See ya. And then we're shocked when we get caught. Oh, God, help me. How did I get here? Because we're stupid. Okay? So... That trumpet blast goes out. Now I know uh, some people have, and for years I actually taught also that this last trumpet was the last trumpet in Revelation. I believe the last trumpet in Revelation is dealing specifically with the Jews. This I don't believe is dealing specifically with the Jews. Because Paul is writing to a Gentile church. Okay, Not that there weren't Jews there. But, but at this point in the history of the church, the church had transitioned from a predominantly Messianic Jewish faith, the, they were called the people of the way, to a predominantly Gentile fellowship. Okay? And, and I, I'm not talking about their condition in the church, I'm talking about where they came from prior to the church. Okay? And so I believe that Paul is writing this saying, hey look, Man, when, when God comes to snatch us away, by the way, people don't get tripped up if somebody comes at you and says, hey, you know, the word, the rapture is not in the Bible. Yeah. <coughs> okay? You're right. We don't translate the word rapture, but the, the word that we get, rapturos, the Greek, is snatched away, caught away, caught up, and that is in the Bible. We just took a Greek word and we transliterated it for our own usage, just like baptism. Okay? Baptism is not an English word originally. It comes from the Greek baptismos. And we took that word and we didn't have an equivalent in our language that fit. So we just took that and said, yeah, we'll keep that. Baptism. Okay? Rapture is the same concept. So when somebody comes at you and says, yeah, rapture's not in the Bible. Yeah, not in that spelling. But if you go back to the original language, rapturos absolutely is in there. It's the snatching away, the catching up. Okay, so don't let people come in. One of those things that, that we have got to be prepared is that we have always got to be ready to give a ready defense for the gospel. And it, you can't give a ready defense if you don't know it. If you're not ready, if you don't understand this, when somebody comes, um, I was talking with uh, David on, on Wednesday after prayer. We were talking about uh, the Mormon church. The Mormon church is going through an incredible loss of people over the last couple of years. They're losing tens of thousands of people. But what, what's, that's good. That's something that we want. We want people to be delivered from that lie. But a lot of them aren't coming to Christ. They're, they're, they're jaded. They're hurt. They're angry. They're bitter. They don't want anything to do with any religion. But what scares me more is that the majority of new believers that are brought into the Mormon church 
and into the Jehovah's Witness Church are Christians. Or at least people that profess to be Christians. Because the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses know their platform, their doctrine, <coughs> they know our doctrine better than most of us do. So when they come and they do things like uh, uh, tell you that, that uh, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and, and that is a literal thing. He is not God, but He is the Son of God. He is the offspring of God. You have to have a good understanding of Scripture to be able to defend the Trinity. Okay? Or, or when the Jehovah's Witness come to you and, and they try to attack the Trinity and say that, you know what, God has three faces and they call it the three-faced God and they present their scriptures and, and they twist them and they turn them a little bit to fit their thinking. If you are not prepared to defend those things first, <clears throat> when they come knock on your door, don't invite them in. It don't, don't. You, you are asking somebody that is worshiping a demonic entity into your home to spout their philosophies that they receive from a demonic entity into your Christian home. Don't. Tell them, no thank you. Don't, don't accept their material. Wish them well. Pray for them. Pray, tell them you're praying for them. I'm praying that God reveals the truth to you. But don't, don't bring that into your house. Okay? Christians are falling to this because they don't know the word of God. I, I would challenge you guys, and I want this to be an ongoing challenge. When I preach from the Word, I want you to be like the Bereans. Go back and study the Word. See if what I'm saying is true, that if I'm on target. I'm human. I'm going to make mistakes. We're human. We're going to disagree. Okay? One of these days, we're going to stand before God and find out how much we all got wrong. Okay? So, so I, it, it's not going to stress me out. Come and talk to me. If there's something you go, hey, well, what about this? Come talk to me. I love digging into the Word of God. I love having dialogue about the Word of God. Okay? So, <clears throat> where does this leave us? Taking these passages together, sticking these things together, I believe that the Feast of Trumpets is the prophetic foretelling of the rapture. The snatching away of God's church, of, of Christ's bride, out of the world. That when that trumpet blows and that great blast goes, that I'm out of here. And I'm going to be looking around to see if all of you are with me. Okay? Because that's my hope. Actually, that's my fear. Is how many brothers and sisters in Christ that, that I have fellowship with years are not saved. And when that trumpet blows, they're going to be looking around going, what was that? Okay? So the Feast of Trumpets, I believe absolutely that the fulfillment of that will be the rapture of the church. That, that Christ is coming back for his bride. He will remove her out of the way. I think that will, will remove the last blockage of what the enemy is holding the enemy back. The enemy will come in. He will wreak his havoc. Uh, we will see the, the tribulation period. We'll see all the ugliness happen. We'll see the wrath of God poured out on mankind, and then Jesus will come back. He will actually set his foot on the Mount of Olives, and he will establish his kingdom reign. Okay? So that all that part of the second coming of Jesus, remember the, the, the Passover was the first coming of Jesus. That was the climax of his first coming. But that came at the end of his life. Okay? When he comes the second time, that's the start. But it's his coming. That's a, that's the, he's coming with a bang. He's coming with a loud trumpet blast. All right? And then we're going to see very quickly the fall feasts being fulfilled. All right? All right, Father, we bless you this morning. And I ask God that you would take your word and you would seed it deep in our hearts. Father, that it would be stored safely in our minds that as we go about our work, it could be brought back to our minds that we would ponder the great things that you've given us, the words of truth and life that you've given us. And I ask God that your holiness would be transparent in our lives, that it would shine through, that, Father, we would be prepared to give an answer to whoever would ask, that we would have a ready defense, that, Father, as the world comes against your, your church, your bride, your words, that, Father, we would be up to the task because your word says that that's your spirit will give us the words to speak. But, Father, we have to know it. We have to be in to your word. Give us a longing, a desire to be in your word. Father, help our minds to be sharp, to retain knowledge of your word. 
I just ask God that this would, would burst forth in us and it would bear much fruit and that, Father, we would be uh, making use of it in our daily lives. We bless you. We thank you, Father. We wait for that trumpet blast. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>